From Dracula to Edward Cullen, pop culture has long been fascinated by handsome, blood-sucking vampires. But once upon a time, vampires were more than just an entertaining monster for a story. People thought they were real, and the proof seemed to be everywhere. The lore behind the famous shape-shifting bloodsucker can actually be traced to a series of diseases that ravaged North America and Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries. Today, we're going to take a look at how a 19th century disease panic created vampires as we know them. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other folklore and creepy history you would like to hear about. Okay? I've come to suck your blood! Ah, 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 ah. In the late 18th through late 19th century, New England was plagued by tuberculosis. Also known as consumption, the infectious disease originated from bacteria. Since germ theory wouldn't be proposed until the 1870s and widely accepted until the 1880s, doctors and medical researchers of the era had little to no knowledge of the disease, its causes, or potential treatments. One of the deadliest plagues in human history, tuberculosis would ultimately kill 2% of New England's total population. With no vaccine or antibiotics to treat it, the infected had very few options. The most common treatment was to send tuberculosis patients to a sanatorium. For those who couldn't afford that, there were only mythical explanations and folk remedies. Tuberculosis was scary, and people were afraid not only of the disease, but of those infected by it. One contemporary doctor wrote of how the emaciated figure, sweaty brow, red cheeks, sunken eyes, and offensive, laborious breath common to tuberculosis patients struck most people with terror. Striking at a time when many believed in the supernatural, it's easy to see how the symptoms of the frightful disease, like fatigue, appetite loss, and weight loss, capture the imagination. Over time, these symptoms were slowly transmuted into the characteristics of vampires. A retired Connecticut state archaeologist who spent time excavating the remains of vampires buried in the 1800s points out the symptoms seemed to imply something or someone was sucking the life right out of the victims. It's this line of reasoning that led people to believe vampires would suck the blood right from their victims. But that's not where the similarities stop. Other symptoms inspired different parts of the vampire mythos. For example, tuberculosis was known as the White Plague because its victims would often turn pale just like the classic depictions of vampires. The manner in which tuberculosis spread also contributed to the vampire mythos. Those infected with TB can often take days to show their symptoms. This meant many would spread the illness to their family and then die before the others started showing their own symptoms. Given the supernatural inclinations of the period and the lack of anything resembling a modern understanding of disease, some concluded that their dead relatives were rising from the grave and returning home to suck the life out of their living family. Still others believed their deceased family members had psychic connections to their living relatives that allowed them to communicate without leaving the grave. Given that people were scared both of the possibility of contracting tuberculosis and the possibility that their own undead family members were going to return from the grave to suck out their life force, fear and paranoia were common. In some places, citizens even began digging up the suspected vampire and killing them again in order to stop them from attacking the living. Author Michael Lee Bell characterized such events as therapeutic exhumations. Often, people were personally digging up their own deceased family members and mutilating them. I guess that's a type of therapy. Bell was able to identify eight separate instances of these therapeutic exhumations in 1800s New England. And you thought your family gatherings were tough. Once the suspected vampire was dug back out of the ground, what happened next would vary depending on where in the region it was occurring. Some communities in Maine and Massachusetts would simply flip the dead body over and then rebury it. In other areas, the townsfolk would check the exhumed body's heart for blood. If blood was found, the most likely conclusion was that they had found a vampire. Usually, the heart would be removed and then burned. Family members would sometimes be allowed to inhale the smoke, which was believed to prevent the further spread of the disease. In other instances, the family members would eat the ashes. Very peaty. In one case, a 19-year-old from Exeter, Rhode Island, named Mercy Brown, succumbed to tuberculosis in 1892. Her sister and mother had already died of the same disease, but her brother Edwin had not. However, he quickly became sick. 
Concerned townspeople dug up Mercy's body and found blood in her heart and mouth. Concluding that she was a vampire, they burned her heart and mixed it into a potion for her sick brother to drink. The potion obviously didn't work, and Edwin passed away a few months later. Sometimes families would dig up their deceased relatives who had passed away years earlier. In such cases, the remains were often decomposed to the point of being nothing but bones. This raised a tough question. How do you kill a skeletal vampire? Well, if the people decided the skeleton was in fact a threat, they would typically rearrange the bones into a skull and crossbones pattern. This, it was believed, would prevent the undead from rising and terrorizing the living. Over in Europe, they had their own way of doing things. Suspected bloodsuckers were dug up and then burned, rearranged, or had a stake driven through their heart. That last method eventually made its way into fiction, and today is probably the most well-known method of slaying vampires. That, or death by stereo. Our knowledge of the great New England vampire panic owes much to a handful of recent archaeological discoveries. In the early 1990s, two boys in Griswold, Connecticut were playing when they stumbled upon a gravel pit that contained 27 graves. The bodies collectively belonged to two families that had both been ravaged by tuberculosis, the Rays and the Waltons. Turns out, during the 1850s, two sons of Henry and Lucy Ray, named Lemuel and Elisha, died of tuberculosis. In 1854, their third son, Henry Nelson, also contracted the disease. Contemporary newspaper accounts record that the family dug Lemuel and Elisha out of their graves, burned them, and then reburied them. Henry Nelson, it's believed, lived for years. Yet burning corpses wasn't the only method the people of Griswold used to deal with suspected vampires. In the same burial plot, archaeologists discovered a coffin with markings that identified it as holding the remains of a man named John Barber. Inside the coffin, the archaeologists found evidence that the man had died of tuberculosis. It was also discovered that five full years after being interred, Barber was dug up, had his head hacked from his spine, and his femurs rearranged into an X-shaped pattern. There was also evidence someone had tried to remove his heart. While tuberculosis does explain a lot, it wasn't the only disease that may have inspired the legends about vampires. It may have had some help from another illness that was common in the 1700s and 1800s, namely rabies. It was Dr. Juan Gomez Alonso of Spain who, in 1998, first made the connection between the folk monsters and the second disease, which was widespread in Europe. Dr. Gomez Alonso noted that a rabies outbreak that was known to have occurred in Hungary from 1721 to 1728 was quickly followed by a so-called vampire epidemic. Gomez Alonso pointed out that both rabid animals and people with rabies often bite each other, which, in turn, passes on the disease to the bite victim. The resemblance between this transmission and the way vampirism is believed to spread is pretty apparent. Rabies is also known to cause a hypersensitivity to sunlight and strong smells, like garlic. Even the idea that vampires don't cast a reflection in the mirror might owe its existence to rabies, since people were not considered rabid if they were able to stand the sight of themselves in a mirror. Based on these similarities, the doctor concluded that some symptoms of rabies had made their way into vampire lore. The eroticizing of vampires in fiction goes at least as far back as Bram Stoker's 1897 novel, Dracula. The sexy vampire remains popular today, as anyone who's seen Twilight can tell you. However, even this might be attributable to a disease. Rabies is known to affect the areas of the brain that govern sleep and libido. The condition can cause insomnia, which may be responsible for the notion that vampires are nocturnal, as well as having a heightened sex drive. In fact, in 2014, one rabies patient was found to be able to have sex 20 to 30 times a day, and some infected men have reported the ability to maintain an erection for days. That is a curse. That being said, we'd like to remind our viewers who may be getting ideas that rabies can kill you, so stick with the Viagra. The very rabies outbreaks that inspired vampire lore are known to have affected dogs, wolves, and other animals. This is possibly the reason that many depictions of vampires include the power to transform themselves into various types of animals. Bram Stoker's Dracula, for example, could turn into a wolf or even a large dog. Dracula could also turn into a bat, but the connection between bats and vampires likely entered the mythos from a different source. 
since bats weren't known to Europeans until the early Renaissance and the discovery of the Americas. The fact is, because of their taste for blood, vampire bats were named after vampires and not, as many believe, the other way around. A quick fun fact here, vampire bats, unlike their fictional counterparts, do not actually suck blood from their victims. They just make an incision and then lick the blood up. Mmm, that's good. In addition to rabies and tuberculosis, some believe that vampirism was inspired by a rare genetic disorder known as porphyria. Porphyria causes a breakdown in the body's production of heme, which is the red pigment in blood. The condition can also cause a hypersensitivity to light, which is, of course, a vampire trope. Additionally, porphyria can cause gum tissue to recede, which can give ordinary teeth the appearance of being fang-like. It's also believed by some that drinking blood might cure the symptoms of porphyria. However, many scientists have rejected this explanation on the basis that drinking blood would not alleviate porphyria, and that the disease was not nearly common enough to explain the widespread belief in vampires. Bram Stoker was not the first author to write about vampires, but given the outsized influence of his novel, Dracula, he might as well have been. The book is responsible for codifying many of the vampire rules we still think of today. Despite this, Stoker's Dracula isn't as well known as one might think. When most picture Dracula, they see a suave, handsome aristocrat in a debonair cape. However, that image actually comes from the 1931 film adaptation starring Bela Lugosi. In Stoker's novel, Dracula is a withered and ugly old man, more like the villain in the 1922 silent film Nosferatu. Subsequent writers and filmmakers continued to reinvent the character and evolve the myth that surrounded him. Dracula continues to fascinate audiences to this very day, as does the very idea of vampirism. So what do you think? Who is your favorite fictional vampire? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other creepy stories from our sister site, The Graveyard Shift.